necessary endings, necessary endings. And so I'm going to back end scripture on this today. Um, and so to tell you kind of where we're at uh, and to give you kind of heads into it, uh, we're on the Bible app. If you have the Bible app, go to of more and then events. I have some time today. I'm going to run with this, have some fun today. Uh, so um, Bible, I mean, click on events, click on more, and you'll find it uh, right there uh, for today. And so I'm going to back end scripture on this. Um, and I'm going to talk about a topic that God was very clear to me about that I cannot talk about for the next year, uh, for the next year, because uh, this gets in the way so, so often when we talk about making disciples. Uh, and so I want to give you something, though, as I keep saying, bits and pieces are uh, just kind of goals for next year. Um, God was wrestling with me about, um, so we have a vision statement about being a radical ethnic community that reached those who are far from God, rebuilds families, reach those who walked away from the church, we do this through prayer, worship, generosity, uh, and, and service. And so uh, our vision statement, mission statement does not change. Mission is Matthew 28. No matter how you remix mission, mission is going to be the same, to reach those who are, to reach to teach, teach to keep, and keep, and then teach them to do the same thing. Our values speak about what's important to us, and that's prayer, worship, generosity, and service. And so God was wrestling with me about a purpose statement, a purpose statement that speaks to something very simple and what we communicate. And so as, um, as we talk about purpose, purpose, vision says where we're going, mission says how we get there, values say what's important to us, but purpose says who we are, right? Who we are as a congregation. And so here's what I'm wrestling with in three words that you'll see and I'm going to preach through and spend a lot of time talking about because as we have gospel conversations and if we want to bring someone even to this space. Who are we? Um, and so here's the purpose statement that I've been wrestling with, and it says this, we are a community of Christ-led dreamers, innovators, and active agents of change in our providence. We create spaces to learn about Christ. We radically challenge each other to live in communion with Christ, and we're continuously pressed to lead others to Christ. In other words, we do three things here, and we learn, we live, and we lead. That's it. Can y'all say that with me? Say learn, learn. live, live lead. You're going to get tired of saying that every single week, but <laughs> learn, live, lead. That we continue, we state purpose as to who we are. We are a group of Christ-led dreamers, innovators, and active agents of change that learn, live, and lead. And so as I reflect upon this and kind of just continue to think about 2019, but before I got into 2019, I said it last week that we cannot end, we cannot begin well if we don't end well. We cannot begin well if we don't end well. And so this series is simply called Necessary Endings because reflection turns in information into insight. Reflection turns information into insight. One of the ways that sometimes we miss the future and miss opportunities is because we don't take time to pause and look back over even the past week. And so last week we talked about ending feeling sorry for myself. And we talked about anxiety and insecurity and stress and how the writer of 1 Peter challenges us to cast all of our cares upon the Lord because He cares for us, right? To cast all our cares upon the Lord because He cares for us. So whenever I feel sorry for myself, I feel anxious, I feel insecure that God reminds me I'm so valuable that I can give God everything. So this week, uh, God wrestled with me about a topic that, like I said, I cannot talk about for another 54 weeks because it gets into the way of really a lot of times we want to build community. And that topic today is interpersonal conflict, interpersonal conflict. Uh, sometimes we use interpersonal conflict as a means to block us from talking about Jesus, uh, or means as a way to put ourselves on pedestals among others, or to dumb ourselves down because we don't feel good enough. So we either demonize or deify people instead of really making sure that the only person who's worshipped in any space we're in is Jesus Christ. And so I want to tell you how I got here. I've been doing some research, um, doing some research on homiletics, which is the study of preaching. And uh, as I've been doing research on homiletics, I decided I was going to take uh, the same scripture and take three different races of pastors. So I took white pastors, black pastors, and Latin pastors, and I took them to, to understand the same scripture. So the scripture was, love your neighbor as yourself. And so I took educated pastors, they have master's degrees, they have doctorate degrees, at least something from either a seminary or a liberal arts university. Um, so they are educated white, black, or Latinx pastors in social justice, liberation, theology, all of that type of stuff. And so there's a small sample size, but I was really curious to see how do those churches, how do those pastors unpack love your neighbor as yourself? And so I took this, and it was really a fun uh, thing, and I'm still doing research 
to them, looking at how they dress, how they present themselves, what their ministries look like, how people listen to their sermons, how they respond, call and response, all of that. And so I understand, before I get into what I'm going to say, there are some systemic structures to address. I mean, there's innate privilege to white bodies, there's innate privilege to all of that, I get that. But there is a stark difference in the way that these sermons, word for word, were said among black and white pastors, right? So when white pastors preach the text, love your neighbor as yourself, they talk contextually, they talked about uh, what it means to build with who, who's my neighbor, who's my good neighbor, who do I consider my bad neighbor, all these different things about my neighbor, how God puts neighbors around us in order to build community with those neighbors. He, they also acknowledged, um, every one of the sermons acknowledged that the only enemy, the only quote unquote bad neighbor we have is who Jesus called the evil one, and the evil one is the devil, right? And so we have, may have bad neighbors, but if we find someone who has demonic tendencies through prayer and fasting, we can remove any demon from any person, right? That's where we see the story of the, the, the man in, 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 the, in, the, in the graveyard, that when they went into the graveyard, through prayer and fasting, we can cast out demons. So I never want you to get so caught up in the person, because God calls us to live in community, right? That's what we see when the white pastors talk about this. It was amazing, Deacon Green, because I listen to the black pastors, and every single one of the black pastors, myself included, had at least the same word they said one time in every one of the sermons. And that one word was the word haters. Every single one of the black pastors, they talk, hater this, hater that, shake them haters off. All oh, your haters can't get this. Nobody understands your story because they don't get your glory. All this type of stuff. They were great sermons, but instead of focusing on how we build community with every person, it was how we keep our focus on how we deify people or demonize people and talk about other people around us. And the focus was not on Jesus. The focus was on how I can hate, how I can be down because I made it to church today. All the folk around me hate me, but because I I made it to church, I'm the perfect person, um, even though that the person that I think is hating me is at another church being told that they got haters and I'm the hater they got. So now we go back to work and all we're doing is hating one another because I got to shake my haters off, right? And, and we do all this time demonizing or demonizing people around us. There is not a challenge to grow, a challenge to build community because we sit here and say, I'm the perfect one. Everyone else around me is terrible, but I know I did some things in my past, but because I made it to church, I got some haters but God's going to make my haters my elevators, right? And all of this. And I, I got so tired because I think in the black church, myself included, we do a very good job of demonizing people. We do a very good job of deifying people so much so that we keep, we make it okay to keep hatred of others or to live into the hatred we think or assume other people have. And so I'm, by no means am I telling you this morning you ought to be best friends with everyone because that's just not possible. I'm just frustrated of how often in our own black community we spend so much time hating on the people that look just like us. We can't get to systems and we can't get to structures and we can't get to glass ceilings. We can't get to gender inequity. We can't get to race situations. We can't get to sexual situations and questions because we're spending so much time talking about how the same black person, the same person in my family, person on my job, person in my church, I, they hate me so much and we don't recognize the love of Christ in spite of that. And we spend so much time talking about people and what do people think and what are people saying and what are people going to do to me, positive and negative, and we never, and we spend so much time on this hater, and we never even talk about how there are times where we're the hater to somebody else, but we're always getting hating on, right? And we, we, we never talk about how we've gossiped over someone else, how we've talked about somebody else, how we've created spaces to hurt someone else, and let me tell you what that does. Whenever we live into those convoluted realities, what we're saying is that person does not deserve the grace of God on their life. So when you're saying, well, I wish they lose their job, I hope they get sick, I hope something happens with their children. I hope something happens to their future. Let me tell you what you're doing. You're literally going up to God, sitting on the throne, and saying, God, you're good and all, but you got it wrong with that person. And so if you would just excuse yourself off the throne, let me get on the throne. I can fix what you've messed up. I can deal with what you've done. Because God, because they talked about me, they need to lose their job. Because they talked about me, God, they need to get sick. God, I know you're good at everything, but you messed up with that good and perfect gift, God, and they don't deserve that because my anger is more important than your 
your grace. My animosity is more important than your grace. My vindictive spirit is more important to you than your grace. And I'm going to get to scripture, but too often in our spaces, we've done a great job demonizing or deifying others and telling God we'll just fix it on the other side. And so here's the necessary ending. Here's the funeral you need to have this week. Here's the funeral that this year God is challenging me not to even touch because anytime we talk about interpersonal conversations, it's going to be how we can speak to both those we consider enemies and those we consider friends to talk about Jesus. Here's the necessary death, the necessary funeral, the necessary ending for you this week. And that funeral is ending caring about what they think, about what they say, and about what they do. I'll say this again. Here's the funeral you have this week. Stop caring about what they say, about what they think, and about what they do. I'm going to get to Scripture, but I wanted to back in this because I didn't want you to forget the Scripture by the time I got to it. And here's what I want you to think about. I want you to reflect for a moment. I want everyone in the room to think about all of 2018. You have 168 hours in a week. How much time, how much energy, how many conversations in your head, how many text messages, how many emails, how many meetings, how many happy hours, how many dinners, how many reunions have you had, even in your head or in person, all about they? I want you to think about that. If you have 168 hours in a week, how many hours, how many weeks did you lose this year consumed with they? How many emails did you send this year consumed with they? How many text messages did you send this year consumed with they? I really want you to think about this. How many weeks did you mess up that they for some of you? Maybe your coworker, maybe your a family member, maybe someone you go to church with and be a classmate, maybe someone you went to school with, whatever that is. How much food did you not eat this year because of they? How many counseling sessions have you gone to because of they? How many nights haven't you slept? How many hours of sleep did you lose when you already don't get enough sleep because of they? How much, how angry, how much anger, how many, how much, how much energy have you expended on anger that won't lead to constructing something all about they? I'm challenging you this year to end caring what they think. Here's why. They didn't die for you. I hope you hear me. They didn't come to earth for you. They didn't wrap themselves up for you. They didn't prophesy over your life. They didn't come and give you life. They didn't hang on a cross for you. They didn't get up for you. They didn't live for you. They're not waiting to come back for you. And you're consumed so much with they when Jesus is standing next to you saying, but I came and I gave you life. I came and I care for you. I came and I love on you. They are not worth the energy that you can give in worship back unto God. How much energy did you expend this year worried about they? How many phone conversations have you had this year about they when you could have been praying for the they to come to Christ? How many text messages did you send this year worried about they when you could have been texting them scriptures to learn about Christ? How many, how many meetings did you have this year about they when you could have gotten coffee with they to lead them to Christ? How, many, how much anger did you give to they this year when you could have used that passion to build the body of Christ? How much energy did you give to they this year that you could have lose to lose weight, to build Build your family, to love on your children, to study God's word. How much energy did you waste this year on they? And some of you are saying, Pastor Justin, you don't get it. You don't know what they said. You don't know what they thought. You don't know what they did to me. I don't know and I don't care because I want you to forgive yourself for caring so much about they because let me tell you, they don't care about you. But let me tell you this, they, you both have a story. They have a story. You have a story. They have a future. You have a future. They have a past, you have a past. They have opportunities, you have opportunities. Let me tell you something. Here's why we can say that. There is something about your worst enemy that Jesus died for. I'm going to say this again. There is something about the worst person you think in your life that Jesus came down to earth for, got on a cross for, died for, got up for, and allowed them to wake up this morning and to breathe new life. So here's what I want to challenge you. Jesus did not give you the authority to figure out why he died for them. Jesus did give you the authority to praise him for why he died for you. And so what if you gave more energy focusing on why Jesus died for you instead of figuring out why Jesus died for them? Because Jesus came and went to Calvary for you and you broke 
broken self. Jesus hung on a cross for you and your broken self. Jesus stayed in a tomb for you and your broken self. Jesus got up from the cross for you and your broken self. So spend more time consumed with why he died for you instead of judging why he still gives life to those who you cannot stand. Am I talking to anybody in the building? End caring what they think. Here's why. It does not matter. It's not worth your energy. It's not worth your frustration. It's not worth your anger. It's not worth your attention. Too often we waste weeks, weeks, I'm not talking days this year, weeks in your home, in your jobs, because you're so consumed with what they think. So here's the necessary ending. End caring what they say, what they do, and what they think, and whatever word you want to put there. And I'm saying this to you today because this is not easy. And here's why. Interpersonal relationships come together, and the reason we get conflict in those is because your expectations weren't met. So there's a certain level of expectation that you have on a relationship that that person met, exceeded, that you can't live up to, or they didn't meet, and now you're frustrated because they didn't do it. So you came into the relationship, and so it's not that they didn't invite you to the Christmas party. It's that when you got there, and everybody wore purple, and you wore blue, now you're mad at the person who organized it because they didn't tell you now that you think they want to embarrass you, and literally they just forgot to send a text message, right? It, 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 these simple, small issues lead to interpersonal conflict. Let me tell you something. The issue is never the issue. The reason you have conflict with that person, the issue is not the issue. The issue is not the person. The issue is some inner insecurity you might have. The issue is not the person. The issue is your anger. The issue is not the person. The issue is your fear. The issue is not the person. The issue is something that's going on in your own life that now you've cast it onto somebody else. And let me tell you something, the hate, the anger you're casting onto somebody else is a piece of you that you're refusing to give unto God because you feel more comfortable hating on a person downing a person, but really what you're doing, and I want you to envision this, every time you get into something like this, imagine yourself stabbing the gift that Jesus gave to you in blood-stained hands. That's the issue. So what is the issue? What creates conflict in the relationships around you? What is it that oftentimes as you get into conflict with somebody and 10 years later or a month later after the conflict is over and you've said to yourself, you know, really, I should have responded this way. What is that issue? That's the issue I want you to take to God. So I want to give you a couple of principles real quick. Am I helping anybody this morning? I just want to help you. I want to give you a couple of principles this morning to wrestle with. The first principle I want to give you in terms of how, um, steps to ending this, steps to ending this. This is not uh, universal. This is not particular. This is just some universal principles. Number one, forgive yourself this year for bowing at the altar of somebody else's forgiveness and forgive yourself this year for bowing at the altar of somebody else's affirmation. Here's what that means. You've been telling yourself, I need you to need me in order for me to move forward. I need you to affirm me in order for me to move forward. If they come and they beg for my forgiveness, then I can move forward. Can I tell you something? Forgive yourself for bowing at the altar of somebody else's forgiveness or affirmation. And I said it earlier, and I'm going to say it again, because they did not die for you. They did not get up for you, and they are not coming back for you. I put it like this, um, and because you're, you're not presenting your best, what happens is you begin to present what others want. So you're not giving your best out. You're not living fully into the gift and the mandate and the call that God's living, calling you to live into. You're presenting what others want. So therefore, a lot of times, we've dumbed ourselves down and the future down because we're living into what we believe others think of us instead of living into what we believe and call that God is calling us to do. I'll give you this example. I remember when I first started preaching, and uh, I would start preaching sermons, and I couldn't live Deacon Green. And so somebody came up to me afterwards and said that was a good sermon. And so I remember I would preach, folk would be laying on the altar, prostrate, all this type of stuff. And I'd sit there and look at my pastor, like, Pastor Justin, what do you, not Pastor Justin, I was a minister. Justin, what do you think? And I'd sit there and say, man, I think I flunked. That was the worst sermon I ever preached in the world. And then some random person come up to me in the receiving line. That was a good sermon. Okay, now it's a perfect sermon. It's a great sermon. Instead of living into the fact that this is what God told me to say, this is how God told me to say it, this is what God told explicitly how to communicate it, and whether or not someone 
likes it or does not like it does not change God's voice. And the issue that so many of us live into is you're waiting for someone to affirm you. And so you wear certain clothes, not because you like it, but because you know the last time you wore it, somebody said you looked good in it. You wear, you drive certain things, not because you like to drive it, but because the last time you were in it, somebody said you looked good in that. My challenge to you is forgive yourself for bowing at any altar. There's not an altar Jesus is standing on. The second thing I want to give you today is forgiveness does not always mean reconciliation. Forgiveness does not always mean a reconciliation. Here, reconciliation asks this question. Does this relationship at her best build the kingdom of God? I'm going to say this again. Does this relationship at her best build the kingdom of God? If it doesn't, if it's going to be something that you continue, that there's, that's the challenge for some of us to continue to work on, to grow and to move in some spaces in our lives that need to be rested, that need to be fleshed out, need to be challenged, need to work through our anger and through our fear because we can sit here and say, I forgive you, I want to be best friends with you, but you have not gotten over, you have not gotten through your anger, your fear, your insecurity, your animosity, that relationship relationship at that moment and point in time is not the best for the kingdom of God. If you know that at any given moment you're going to blow your gasket and destroy the kingdom of God because of your cussing spirit, because you fully haven't gotten over something, then don't feel the need to build relationships immediately after some sort of conflict, right? Forgive, reconciliation says, is this best for the kingdom of God? If it's not in that moment, that's why you see some relationships taking 20 to 30 years to have some some sort of conversation because in that moment and the place you're at be comfortable where you are growing in Christ where you are because everybody is not welcome at the level that you're at everybody cannot handle you and you cannot handle everybody and so forgiveness in the season you're in does not always mean reconciliation and I want you to own that and, and get over some of you get over thinking you have to be best friends with everybody recognize there's power in relevant relationships Relationships, not the quantity of your relationships. There's, it's better off for you to have two good friends than to have 30 acquaintances around you. The last thing I want to give you today is that winning people is more important than winning arguments. Winning people is more important than winning arguments. Free yourself from trying to win arguments. There's an old African proverb that says this, when two elephants fight, the only thing that suffers is the grass. When two elephants fight, the only thing that suffers is the grass. Winning people is more important than your pride to say you want an argument. And that goes to relationships in your houses, that goes to marriages, that goes to friendships. It's more important to win that person to Christ than it is to sit there and leave and dust your shoulders up and say you won. So what's the scripture? And I'm finished. What's the scripture for today? With all of that, here's where the scripture gets to. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. I wanted to give you those principles because this is a mind thing. Remember I said ending caring. Good to see you, Tim. Ending caring. How's your son? How's your son? How are you? Oh, you, okay. Um, ending caring about what others think about you. Now, here's what I want to give you today. Turn to Philippians 4. Paul is communicating to a church he loves. And he says, here's what I want to teach you. And I want to read this scripture. And I'll give you a principle really quick. I want to read this scripture for you. Philippians 4. And Paul says this, therefore, my brothers and sisters, he crescends this. So remember, in Philippians chapter 3, Paul is saying, I press on towards the mark for the prize of the higher calling uh, that's in Christ Jesus. Why? Because there's nothing on earth that can be given unto me that matches the power that Jesus can give to me. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying, I want the peace that only Jesus can give. And I want you to see the scripture today, uh, Philippians 4, beginning of verse 1. So look what Paul says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the way of the Lord, dear friends. I plead with you, Doyle, I plead with Sintik to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they've contended at my side and the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. So rejoice in the Lord always, and again I'll say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident, for the Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in every situation, by prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your request to God. And look at verse 7. And the peace of God that absolutely makes no sense, that transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. Let me tell you something. In every relationship, you have to protect your peace. Protect your peace. It will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So here's what I want you to get today. Here's the litmus test for your relationships. Finally, my brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, look at this pitch in the text. If it's excellent or praiseworthy, then think on those things. 
Paul says here, I want you to build community. And when he gets to verse number 8, Paul says, after you guard your heart, after you're constantly rejoicing and looking for joy, after you take your worries to Jesus, Paul says, God will give you peace that makes no sense. So how do you live into the peace that makes no sense? Paul says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is admirable. And I love this part. I've read this text. I've preached this text for years. I've been in ministry now today as of like last week for like 14 years. It's amazing. And look what he says here, if there be anything that is praiseworthy, think on that. That's your litmus test. In this conversation, in this relationship, in this status I put up, in the friendship I have, in the engagement I'm in, in the class I'm in, in the time I'm spending together with people, in the outing that you're going on, can God get praise out of this? Let me tell you, there are some good things that are not praiseworthy, right? I mean, there's some good things. There's some pure things that just aren't really praiseworthy. There's some admirable things that are not praiseworthy. Paul says it it can be good, pure, praiseworthy, noble, upright. But can God receive praise out of this? Take control of your life by negating the things that are trying to control you. Distractions, remember, are nothing more than inner denial in the future that God has given you. I must say that again. Distractions are nothing more than inner denial in the future that God has given you. This is a season where you have to take control of your focus. And here's the password. I told you last week the password, the ending that was I am am somebody. Here's the password for this week. Here's a password I want you to live into this week. And the password is it's not worth it. It's not worth it. It's not worth your health. It's not worth your text messages. It's not worth your statuses. It's not worth counseling sessions. It's not worth your insecurities. It's not worth you crying yourself to sleep. It's not worth losing friendships. It's not worth losing opportunities to talk about Jesus. In this, if you're going into something and it's not praiseworthy, it's not worth it. If you're entering into something that is not going to give you life, it's not worth it. If you're entering into a conversation that is going to make you lose more than gain the love of Christ, it's not worth it worth it. It is not worth it. And I want you to free yourself. This year, as you go into 2019, if you enter into some conversations, even when you get into places with people and it starts to make you lose your mind, you literally can tell them, my pastor said, it's not worth it. It's not worth my anger. It's not worth my fear. It's not worth my past. It's not worth my future. It's not worth my children. It's not worth my money. It's not worth my time. It's not worth more money and counseling sessions. It's not worth my health. It's not worth my body. It's not worth it. Because when you begin to take control of your life, the enemy doesn't control it anymore because it's not worth it. I asked you two questions last week. I'm going to ask you the same questions again this week. So I I can't tell you what relationships to add or remove from your life. I can't tell you how to change those things, but I can ask you two questions because I want you to discern this in your life. Does the person around you enhance your life? When you think about it, when you think about the people around you and you're building relationships, do they enhance, do they add value to your life? Secondly, does this person promote my mental, spiritual, emotional, and physical well-being? Do they, do they push something? And you know, one thing I cannot even joke about, I love Tuesdays so much, and the reason I hate whenever I have meetings on Tuesdays uh, for our senior lunch is because that group gives me so much life. I start my week off with people who just want to come talk about life, talk about Jesus, and go into the day. It adds to my life. I can't have a full week without sitting there for an hour on Tuesdays with our seniors because those seniors, they add to my mental, my physical, my emotional, and spiritual well-being, right? Who around you adds to you? Who around you can you cannot wait to get into their presence? You've been told who matters, you've been told what matters, instead of you discerning what matters. And I want you to think about that, and I'm, I'm finished today, all of this, um, because too often I think this year for so many of us and going into next year, you've gotten so consumed with what they said, you've gotten so consumed with what's around you, and you haven't reminded yourself what God says. And so I want you to concentrate this year not on what they said, what you assume they said, what you're assuming they're thinking, what you think they're saying about you, but I want you to concentrate more on what God says about you. Because they said you ought to lose your job, but you still have it. 
They said you ought to have lost your mind, but you still have it. They said you'll never be great, but you look better than you've ever looked before. They said you'll never be successful, but you still are standing. So what would happen if you didn't negate the prophecy that God has over you, but you said, I know what they said, but I also know what God said. God said, I'm fearfully, wonderfully made. God says, I'm loved beyond measure. God says that my life was worth his death. God says that one day he can't wait to wrap me in his arms again. I know what they said, but I also know what God said. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. This moment I want to be very particular with, and we're finished. Um, I want to give it about two minutes or so. Uh, there was, um, who, who is that person for you? in 2018, that if they were to walk into this room right now, sit down next to you, your heart rate would just shoot up. You, you would do everything you possibly could to try to get out of here because God, why in the world did you let that person in my space? Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a, maybe it's a, yeah, maybe it's somebody you went to school with. I see, some, I see a lot of coworkers right now in your minds. Yeah, I see a lot of coworkers. I see people, I see someone in the room, someone from high school. Who, who is that person? If they were to walk in the room right now, your heart rate would just go crazy. You, you would just, you love the Lord right now, but you got some questions for Jesus. Who, who is that person? Who is that person? Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians to lavish blessings onto those individuals. The reason they're an enemy is that they're an enemy to your future because you've allowed a piece of you to be given to that person that's not given unto God. So it's not the person you're upset with, it's that they represent something, either a failure, they represent something in your past, they represent something you're scared of in the future. And to so many of you in the room, the issue is not your past, the issue is you're scared of how great you possibly could be. And this person represents something beyond yourself that you're afraid that you actually might live into the reality that God does love you beyond your own talents and beyond your degrees. And so I want you to begin to pray for them. I want you, I know it's uncomfortable, but I want you to get uncomfortable so you can free yourself from caring about them. So I want you to go ahead. I want you to begin to pray for them. Pray for their family. Come on. Pray for their future. Pray for their lives. Pray for their strength. Pray for their ability. Pray for, pray for their children. Pray for their jobs. Begin to lavish blessings on them. And I want you to to free yourself of the bondage that you've allowed your mind and your heart to get into by lavishing blessings on that person. They're not your hater. They're actually literally somebody that represents the future. And I want you to begin to lavish blessings on them so that you can take your focus off of them and put it back on God. So pray for them. Pray for their home. Pray for their mind. Pray for their spirit. Pray for their bodies. Pray for their health. God bless them. God hold them. God give them increase. God give them increase. Give them increase. God, give them increase. Give them so much power and authority in the spirit, God. Give them, let, make room for you in their lives so that they, their prayer lives go beyond my own prayer life. Come on, lavish blessings on them. Paul says to lavish it. God, I thank you that you put them in my space. And here's the challenge I want to give you this year. That's the person, one of the people, you can tell about Jesus. There's so many of you right now, there's some broken spaces in your life. There's some, there's some hard places in your life that that person represents. But I want to tell you that now after you've gotten rid of that burden, now Jesus comes to heal that place. So whether it's your anger, it's your fear, it's your insecurity, it's your pain, Jesus is here today saying, I want to heal you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just are so grateful for your love, for your care for us. And Father, in this moment, as some of us have recognized that the reason it's hard for us to build relationships is because of our pride, it's because of our arrogance, because of our fear of the past or fear of the future. Some of the reasons God has been hard for us to build relationships is because of our own anger, um, because God of things that we can't even begin to name. But Father, you know. And so God, in the name of Jesus, I'm so grateful that you allow us to recognize our blind spots so that you can give us focus to keep driving. God, thank you that there's something in today that will allow us to know more about you. And that God, if you allow us to see tomorrow, there's something about in tomorrow 
that will allow us to see more about you. So Father, I come against the caring about what they think, what they say, what they do. And I thank you, God, that you put days in all of our lives, that you can teach us to focus, that you put days, and thank you, you put days in all of our lives, God, so you can teach us how to keep our eyes focused on the goal. You put days in all of our lives, God, so that we can testify like Paul, that we can press on towards the mark that's in you, God. So I thank you for all the days in our lives, the days in our jobs, the days in our homes, the days in church, the days in school, the days that we work with, the days, God, that we go to, that we work out with, the days that we, that we, we eat with, the days that we even go to family reunions with God. But God, I pray that today as we leave out of this space that we that you strip us of the power that we've given today and God as you expose that weak area of our lives that we can give you the worship God as we now make room for you to come into our lives to show us your power your love your care your mercy your peace your love your justice for us God forgive us for all the time we wasted in 2018 worried about they but God as we go into 20 19, whenever they want to bother us, they want to say something, they want to push us, God. We thank you that this year, God, whenever they want to bother us, God, we can lift our hands and say, God, thank you for another opportunity to talk about you. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we just agree with relevant relationships. God, we agree with opportunities to talk about you. God, we agree with opportunities to share about you. Father, we just agree with opportunities to tell the whole world that you are God on the throne. So God, we thank you for dying for us. We thank you that you cared about us as the they that rejected you, that you loved us. We thank you that you cared about us, the they that walked away from you to come for us. We thank you, God, that you cared so much about us, the they that walked away from you, that every day you give us yourself so that one day when you come back, you'll be rejoicing and you won't call us they, but you'll call us we. And so Father, we're grateful today. God, whatever is broken, whatever has been exposed in this place today, I pray that your blood covers it so that no one sees it but you and them. And that, God, this becomes a place for us to give you unabashed, no, no fear-filled, but just grace-filled, heaven-adored, and heaven-loved worship. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Come on, if you love the Lord, would you just rise on your feet and begin to worship the Lord in your own way? Come on, would you just begin to worship the Lord in your own way? Whatever place and room that you've made for God, would you just begin to adore God in your own way and say, God, come into my home, come into my money, come into my job, come into my school, come into my church, come into my mind. Come on, just begin to lift your hands, just begin to open up your mouth and begin to saturate this place with worship. Father, as I make room, for you come into my home as I make room for you come into my job as I make room for you come into my school as I make room for you come into my breaks come into my happy hours come into my Bible studies come into my cubicle come into my car as I make room for you God as I have a deeper appetite for you father come into my life and take over take over my life hallelujah God Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. God, I feel so many of you ridding yourselves of some letters that you have in your head, some issues you have in your head about they. And God is saying, I've been waiting for you so I can come in in a powerful, powerful way. This is a great season for you. There's nothing against you. And God is for you. Father, we agree with this. As we depart from this place in this spirit, Father, we pray that you guide us, that you hold us, that you keep us, that we do not come down off the mountain. We do not come down off the wall this week when, they, when the devil wants to try us this week and when the devil wants to try us today. We do not come off this wall. But Father, we're grateful that you have made so much room for you in our lives that this week, God, is the best week we'll ever have. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Come on, if you love the Lord, put those hands together. Come on, bless the Lord in this place. Bless the Lord in this place. You all have a wonderful week. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.